Welcome to the Answers for Elders radio show. Meet the trusted experts who will give you straight answers and will help guide you on the path of later life care. Now, here's your host, founder, caregiver, and CEO, Suzanne Newman. And welcome back, everyone, to Answers for Elders radio network, courtesy of Athera Pharma, we are speaking with Dr. Michael Mega, who is a neurologist who was trained through UCLA and now is the director of the Center for Cognitive Health in Portland, Oregon. And Dr. Mega, thank you so much for taking some time and talking with us about Alzheimer's disease. And um, we're going to talk a little bit this segment about treatments. What Uh, You know, you just said something that was amazing that 20 years before you ever see a symptom, now we can determine if you have um, plaque in your, in your brain. Is that amyloids? How do we, I guess, did I use the right term? (laughs) Yes, Susan, you did. Um, The field is moving very rapidly in terms of biomarker discovery. Um, There are handful of biomarkers that have been uh, primarily identified through a data set of longitudinally acquired scans and blood tests and pencil and paper testing of elderly cohort called the ADNI data set, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. And Mm -hmm. based upon the ADNI work that we started at UCLA when I was a fellow there, um, It has grown tremendously and serves as a repository for all of the pharmaceutical companies and universities across the world to share and understand what the natural course of normal aging and early Alzheimer's disease is. And so it's through those data sets of uh, all over the world that we've begun to understand that there are some blood biomarkers in addition to PET scans that look at plaque and tangle in the brain, blood biomarkers that significantly correlate to the amount of misfolded amyloid burden and misfolded tau burden a person has in their brain decades before they develop any symptoms. And so we can imagine very soon, once the FDA standardizes the laboratories that are across the country that will be up and running measuring these blood biomarkers, we can imagine that when you go for your annual wellness check, in addition to getting your hemoglobin A1C collected, as well as your cholesterol, you'll get probably a phosphorylated P-tau 181 or P-tau 217 blood biomarker to find out if you're on the slippery slope of developing Alzheimer's disease. So if someone goes in and gets a blood test, let's say in their annual physical, can you request that that test be run? How do you, how can you do that? Okay, so right now the FDA has not approved the laboratories across the country that will be approved to measure, uh, for example, PTAU 181. Um, Lilly, the pharmaceutical company that has denanomab uh, being fast-tracked that just a couple of weeks ago released their phase three data suggesting, supporting that it slows decline in people with early changes by 47%. They have a, a patent on PTAU 217. So I would imagine that Lilly could share that with the rest of the medical community uh, if they get indication and standardization mm-hmm. of laboratory assessments across mm-hmm. the country. So, so once that happens, your yeah. primary care doc can order that. Okay. So to go to your doctor and say, I would like to, um, you know, have, when, have a blood test for this through Lilly, then how, how would that process work, Dr. Mega? Well, we don't know who's going to be the fastest to the, to the shoot. It could be this, uh, uh, there's several P-tau marker. What is P-tau anyway? It's phosphorylated tau. Why does tau get phosphorylated? The theory has been that the soluble form of amyloid beta protein, when it changes and misfolds from a monomer into a C shape, interlocks with other monomers that have misfolded into Cs and eventually creates 
a cylindrical oligomer that is soluble. Oh, wow. Adheres to the cell surface, causing a disruption of memory function that's called long term potentiation, and also hyperphosphorylates. That, that means puts a phosphate on too much of intracellular proteins. Mm -hmm. and that phosphorylation of one intracellular protein that's called tau is the cause of tangle formation. Mm -hmm. And it's actually misfolded tau causing tangles that kills the cells. The oligomer decreases memory function, decreases synaptic density, and through tau misfolding into tangles kills the cells. The oligomer hypothesis is relatively more recent than the amyloid hypothesis. Note that they're always misfolded amyloid proteins, but the plaque is precipitated and not soluble. The oligomer forms plaque after it forms fibrils that get precipitated. Mm -hmm. So there are companies now going after that oligomer or stopping the monomer from misfolding so wow. that we can avoid the very first steps of cell dysfunction from that soluble form of amyloid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so if you get phosphorylated tau, you've already got plaque in your brain. And so wow. P-tau 181 and P-tau 217 closely associate with plaque and tangle via the hyperphosphorylation of, of uh, the tau protein uh, caused by amyloid accumulation. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it takes 15 to 20 years of this process to unfold in order to get symptoms. And some people can have enough plaque and tingle in their brains when they die and not be demented, even though the average Joe with that plaque and tingle burden would be demented. Sure. The theory is that it's those folks who are more active physically, have a better diet, have higher levels of cognitive stimulation that increases their cognitive reserve so they can buffer against the pathophysiologic unfolding of the disease Amazing. better than the person that sits in front of the TV and just sits with his beer watching, well, I don't know. Sitcoms. CNN. <laughs> So, I, that's uh, yeah. So obviously, there's that. How about uh, does heredity take? Um, you know, is yeah, that of part of it? There's over 50 different genes that, in um, genomic-wide assessment studies, have been highlighted as risk factor genes. The most um, robust is the apolipoprotein E4 gene. And you can be born with an E2, an E3, or an E4, one from each parent. So I have Alzheimer's on my dad's side of the family, and I probably got an E4 gene from him, and I have mm -hmm. an E3 gene from my mom. So with one copy of the E4 gene, I'm at roughly a 13% increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease by 65. If I had two wow. copies, that'd be over double. So that's by far the strongest uh, genetic correlation other than mutations in families that have autosomal mm -hmm. dominant inheritance pattern. Right, right. So what Suffice about um, that there's, di there's different ways that you can um, point your treatment with the different molecules that are being developed now. Uh -huh. So Athera, who's sponsoring this program, is pointing their treatment at people that are past mild cognitive impairment and more in the early to mid stage of Alzheimer's disease, Amazing. their molecule tries to make uh, an increase in connections between neural networks via a growth factor, as well as stopping the inflammatory changes that are part and parcel of the immune system trying to clear these misfolded proteins, but then killing innocent cells in their path. Mm -hmm. So their drug, their molecule is targeted for a person further along the spectrum of the disease whereas other molecules are targeted to stop tangle formation while you have early symptoms to keep those uh, cells intact as opposed to 
what I foresee in the future, anti-amyloid drugs pulling plaque out of the brain when you're in the preclinical stage. In other words, preclinical, sure. no symptoms, but you have plaque based on a positive blood test. You know, this is so fascinating. <clears throat> so I'm curious, what about people that have uh, TBI? What happens with that? Well, that's just another uh, way of uh, insulting your your uh, CNS to set you up for an increased risk of Alzheimer's or mm -hmm. uh, a Parkinsonian type of presentation ca called mm -hmm. chronic encephalopathic yeah. uh, traumatic brain disease. Yeah. Um, so the individuals that have repeated head trauma, as you well know, are uh, in a uh, heightened risk for developing degenerative brain diseases, right? Uh, just like the individuals that have diabetes or have heart disease, anything that insults the brain from what we can see increases the overproduction of amyloid beta protein. And if you're not clearing wow. amyloid appropriately and it misfolds abnormally, mm -hmm. then you are uh, set up for later on developing an Alzheimer pattern. Mm -hmm. And obviously there is... Um, you know, I noticed that early onset tends to progress quicker. Um, is that true? That's probably what I have noticed, but maybe I'm wrong on that. No, that is true. Um, there's essentially different types of Alzheimer's disease. Just ah, like okay. have different types of hypertension from different causes, but the early onset ones do have more behavioral abnormalities, have a faster rate mm -hmm. of decline, as well as having more visual spatial problems called posterior cortical atrophy, where mm -hmm. you, they're essentially cortically blind toward the end. Wow. Uh, as opposed to late onset Alzheimer's where grandma gets it in her mate, uh, mid to late seventies and she can still live relatively independently with just a little checkup on her sure. uh, once, a, once a month. As right. opposed to the early onset folks that the bottom falls out on them and they are in a nursing home at the age of 63 or 64. Yeah, it's it's so tragic. Well, Dr. Mega, we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit about diagnosis and treatment and clinical trials coming up in our next segment. We at Answers for Elders thank you for listening. Did you know that you can discover hundreds of podcasts in our library on senior care? So visit our website and discover our decision guides that will help you also navigate decision making. Find us at AnswersForElders.com.